First of all, this is truly a spectacular group of people that are gathered here. I just want to thank everybody that's here. It's been an incredible few days, and uh, I'm privileged to be speaking here. Uh, that's the good news. The, the bad news is that I'm willing to bet that almost every person in this room has some direct experience with a psychiatric condition, whether it's depression, uh, anxiety, maybe bipolar disease, a child with autism, or schizophrenia. These are highly prevalent conditions. And yet the reality is we still understand very little about them. This book is, is called the DSM. It's the Diagnostic Manual Used by Psychiatrists. And in it you'll find a description of symptoms associated with psychiatric disorders, but very little regarding their underlying etiology. Can you imagine going to a cardiologist and you have chest pain? And the doctor says, I know exactly what's wrong with you. You have chest pain. Right? But this is, this is kind of what the, what the state of affairs is like. And by the way, as a neurologist, I'm telling you, we're not any better. When we're tasked to do an organic workup on a patient with uh, an organic workup, on a patient with a psychiatric disorder, we may perform an MRI scans or an EEG, maybe a lumbar puncture if we suspect some type of infectious etiology. But invariably, the results of these tests come back negative. And what do we do? We dismiss these patients with the conclusion it's all in their heads. But we don't actually mean that literally, do we? Psychiatry is in dire need of objective diagnostic markers to help with diagnosis. But we don't have them, or we don't have them yet. One of the reasons is that most emotional states are qualitative. They're, they're dynamic. Uh, they change over time. Unlike a classic lesion in the brain, such as a stroke or a tumor, where does anxiety or depression or schizophrenia actually reside in the brain. Um, imagine a day, though, that we'll have tangible and specific biomarkers in psychiatry. And what if I told you that the smoking gun for many psychiatric conditions may be the immune system, and we could have a, a biomarker for psychiatry that's as useful clinically as any test that we have in oncology or cardiology? We heard Dr. Francis Collins speak earlier this week about the arduous path from discovery to clinic, right? And in, in psychiatry, this gap in translational medicine means persistent suffering and persistent stigma for patients with these disorders. It's why I co-founded a company devoted to accelerating biomarker discovery for patients with psychiatric disorders in the here and the now. Spinoza, who's my favorite philosopher, once said that mind is the idea of the body, a remarkable insight, for which we probably should give him credit to be the father of neuroscience with this, with this concept. But even if we understand what Spinoza was teaching, the question still is, how do our brains create our thoughts? How do they create our feelings? How do they create the emotional, the qualitative states of our existence? And conversely, the, the other question which is important to ask is, how do our emotional states affect our physiology, because we know that they do. I mean, I'm sure every person in this room knows of somebody who's had uh, a significant catastrophic medical illness, whether a stroke or a heart attack, on the heels of some significant emotional trauma. But how does that actually occur? So for me, the question is, how do we cross what seems to be an impossible divide between our phenomenology, our qualitative states of our existence, and our biology over here? It seems like this is, these are two separate states that we have to kind of interact in to create biomarkers in psychiatry. One of the things that I've learned so far in this crazy journey, no pun intended, uh, looking at biomarkers in psychiatry, is that metaphors have their biological equivalent. Metaphors have their biological equivalent. If we look at Freud's taxonomy about ego defense mechanisms, it's very reminiscent about what we now know about the function of the blood-brain barrier which may be disrupted in psychiatric states. And his discussions about transference and countertransference is reminiscent about what we now know about mirror neurons, the ability to hold the thoughts or the feelings of other people inside of our brains. My personal belief is that the sooner we move away from the notion that our minds and brains are separate entities, the sooner we'll have major breakthroughs for patients with serious psychiatric disorders. The good news is, because there is good news here, is that there's right now, we've heard this a, a lot through this, these discussions, there's an avalanche of information coming at us right now from genetics, from proteomics, from brain imaging, all of which help to make the invisible visible. 
because psychiatric disorders in many ways, we can't see them like we can see tumors or strokes. Our challenge is to essentially interpret these seemingly disparate data points, to integrate them, to make them clinically useful for patients in the here and the now. Our ability to meet this challenge, as Risa Sperling talked about earlier this week, will mean diagnosing a patient with Alzheimer's disease prior to the point where the disease strips them of their memories and, and robs them of their identity. It'll mean treating a patient with autism or schizophrenia in a therapeutically specific manner rather than symptomatically. Thank you very much. Thank you.